Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and Happy New Year. Welcome to our first seminar of 2021. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Genevieve Fantibetner, who is joining us from Agilent Research Laboratory. Uh, Genevieve joined Agilent in 2016 with the goal of improving measurement technology. Prior to that, she completed her PhD at UC Berkeley and completed her postdoctoral research at Harvard Medical School. At, Agil at Agilent, uh, Dr. Van de Bidner's work focuses on developing automated sample preparation methods for LCMS metabolomic and lipidomic analyses. And she also explores the combination of seahorse and mass spectrometry metabolomic data. So it is our pleasure to have Genevieve here with us today to learn more about measuring metabolic flux with cellular and molecular resolution. Before I turn it over to Genevieve, I would just like to remind everyone that you can ask your questions at the end of the seminar, either by uh, typing it using the Q&A feature of this webinar, or you can also raise your hand and directly ask your questions. So with that, Genevieve, thank you very much for being here today. We look forward to hearing your talk and I turn it over to you. Thank you, Farnaz. All right, so today, as Farnaz uh, indicated, I'll be talking a little bit about measuring metabolic flux or measuring the rates of metabolic reactions and doing this at both cellular and molecular resolution. And in order to do these types of measurements, I'll be sharing how we use uh, Seahorse XF and LCMS qualitative flux analysis technologies. So to first give a little bit of background on why metabolic flux measurements can be so important, I wanted to direct you to what common cell analysis technologies um, typically do for cell analysis. They often take a steady state or endpoint measurement. And this really gives us a view of, of the cells that is like a photograph. So we get a steady state view. Um, in this example I'm showing on this slide, you might have a highway with cars on it. And the information you're getting from this type of analysis is really just the number of cars in a given section of the highway at a given time. On the other hand, um, in a metabolic flux study, you are getting information that's more akin to a video. So we're really um, able to zero in on things like how fast are all of these five cars moving on the highway? Are they moving slower or are they moving faster? And by getting this, sorts, uh, this sort of information, we're able to know the rate of the traffic. And this can provide insights into where there are traffic jams in cells. This might be uh, regions where there are enzymes that are inhibited or mutated or in low abundance. Um, we can also get an idea of where traffic is moving freely at uh, normal speed. And this might be uh, give an indication of where enzymes are functioning normally and their normal concentrations of enzymes as well as the metabolites that they're interconverting. Um, and then on the other hand, we might find regions where there's really slow traffic and the rate's really slow and uh, or sorry, where the, the rate is really fast. And this might indicate uh, areas where we have upregulated enzymes um, or gain of function enzymes, uh, for instance. So um, the seahorse and the LCMS qualitative flux analyses allow us to get these sort of rate measurements and better understand um, how fast met uh, metabolic inter uh, interconversions are happening within cells. Um, but they do this at two different resolutions. So the seahorse XF analyses really provide us an idea of what our metabolic flux or metabolic rates are at a more city scale view. So what is the combined rate of cars into and out of a city. On the other hand, the LCMS qualitative flux analysis really provides us measurements that are more at the street scale. So we're getting more information about what are the rate of cars on each of the individual streets within the city. Um, in other words, a molecular resolution view. Um, so we'll take a deeper dive into both of these technologies, but um, essentially what the Seahorse XF analysis is giving us is a view into uh, the cellular resolution of how metabolic flux is happening um, within cells sort of at a global scale. And the Seahorse XF technologies focus on looking at glycolysis on one hand and then respiration on the other, and I'll go into some details on that. 
Um, and then the LCMS qualitative flux analyses are really providing us molecular resolution information of how metabolites are interconverting within the cells and at what speeds they're doing this. So this is really um, at the molecular scale. Uh, so this is just a view of the two technologies and what they look like. Um, so I'll focus on the Seahorse XF technologies first. And that's shown on the left. So again, the Seahorse XF, uh, XF measurements are done at sort of a cellular scale and telling us globally what cells are doing. And the XF uh, assays measure the rates of change of two key energy metabolism pathways. Um, the first pathway is, again, glycolysis. And in particular, for the glycolysis measurements, what we're monitoring is we're actually monitoring the extracellular acidification rate um, that is being caused by the cell's metabolism. So in particular, cells will uh, pump lactate into the extracellular space, and we can monitor this lactate production by looking at changes in pH. On the other hand, uh, the seahorse uh, technologies allow us to also look at respiration. And in the case of respiration, what we're really looking at is we're looking at oxygen consumption by the cells. So this is going to be looking at the oxygen consumption rate of the cells. And really here, you're looking at how much are the mitochondria within the cells using oxygen and funneling that through the electron transport chain to make ATP. So an important note about the seahorse assays is that during our ECAR and OCAR analyses, there are four injection ports that we can use, and these can be used to add different compounds to the cells, and then we can look at what the metabolic impact of these compounds are. And we use that to develop a lot of different um, uh, test kits that allow us to look at different components of glycolysis and mitochondrial respiration. So in the first test kit, I'll, I'll just go over a couple of these um, so you're familiar with them before I go into the real data of uh, telling what cells are doing under different conditions. Um, but in one of our, our test kits, we have the uh, cell mitostress test kit. And what this does is it really focuses on the oxygen consumption of the cells or that OCAR value. And we're able to inject different compounds, including oligomycin, FCCP, and etomycin A, and rotenone to the cells during this assay. The cells are live, and we can monitor what happens once these compounds are injected. And these compounds do different things to the cells and allow us to monitor, um, for instance, the ATP production by the mitochondrial res uh, by mitochondrial respiration. We can also get an idea for what is the maximal capacity of the cells uh, to consume oxygen. Um, and then we can also look at the basal respiration levels and non-mitochondrial respiration. In one of our other kits, we have the glycolysis stress test kit. And in this kit, we can look and zoom in more on the glycolysis or the extracellular acidification ECAR rates. And in this case, we again inject compounds to the cells um, as they're live and you know, going on their regular business. And we can use these compounds to detect what is uh, the normal basal rate of glycolysis in these cells, um, what is the maximal glycolytic capacity in these cells. So if they really were pushed to the extreme, how much um, how much flux is there through the glycolytic pathway. Um, and then we also get a measurement for non-glycolytic acidification of the extracellular media. Um, another one of the test kits that'll come up in the first example I'll show later is the cell energy phenotype uh, test. And in this test, what we're doing is we're focusing on both oxygen consumption rate as well as extracellular acidification rate. And as we look at both of these measurements, we put the cells under stress so we can see what their baseline OCAR and ECAR are, as well as what their stressed OCAR and ECAR are. In the next assay, we have a real-time ATP rate assay. And this assay really zeroes in on what is the amount of ATP, rate, uh, ATP produced by both mitochondrial respiration and glycolysis. Um, so this is an ATP production rate assay, and uh, again, zeroing in on both the respiration and glycolysis of the cells. And then finally, another uh, kit that will come up in one of my examples is the substrate oxidation stress test 
And this is very similar to the cell mitostress test. Um, but in this particular case, we're going to be able to look at how much the cells are using different fuel substrates to fuel their oxygen consumption. Um, so we can, in this test, look at whether cells are using long chain fatty acids, uh, glucose and pyruvate, or glutamine to really fuel their oxygen consumption and their electron transport chain. Okay, so that's a little bit of background on the seahorse assays. And next, I wanted to give some background into the LCMS qualitative flux analysis. In this type of analysis, what we're doing is we're using uh, isotope labeled metabolites to really understand what are the rates of interconversion of metabolites. Um, so we can add these isotopically labeled metabolites to cell culture. We can let them sit in that cell culture let them be metabolized by the cells. And then here we use the LCMS technology to both separate those metabolites out um, in liquid chromatography. Um, and then we can measure the mass of those metabolites using mass spectrometry. And this really helps us isolate um, the different isotopes that were in the cells, what we added to the cells, and then also where these isotope went, uh, isotopes went once they were introduced to the cells. Um, through some software that we have, uh, the Agilent VistaFlux software, we're able to um, analyze these isotopes and, and pull them out of the samples that we analyzed. And then we can see uh, where those uh, isotopic labels ended up. And then we also have a visualization software where we can take the metabolites found in VistaFlux and map those onto metabolic pathways so you get a real view of where the isotope labels are going and what pathways they're involved in. So just to give a slightly deeper dive on the qualitative flux analysis, I wanted to go over isotopolog tracking. So what we're doing in our, our analyses here is we're tracking isotopologs. And we're gonna have an example of fumarate that's shown on the left here. Um, so in fumarate, we have four different carbons. If we incubate cells with a uh, carbon-13 labeled glucose, for example, this will eventually get um, into labeled into fumarate. And this will, so the glucose goes through glycolysis and then goes into the mitochondria and it goes into the TCA cycle. And one of the metabolites in the TCA cycle is fumarate. So we can get that label from glucose into fumarate. And we can see in our mass spectrometry data, fumarate in, in the case where it's unlabeled on the left here. And then as each carbon 12 is converted into a carbon 13, we can start to see those mass peaks um, for each additional carbon added. And when we uh, talk about isotopologs, we're really talking about combining all the isotopomers of a, of a given mass. So in fumarate, if we have an M plus one mass, so there's one carbon-13 label, that carbon-13 label can be at any position within this fumarate molecule. And we just combine all of those together in our particular analysis. And so that means we're looking at isotopologs instead of the specific isotopomers. Um, to look at the isotopomers, you would need to have fragmentation. Um, and it's something that you can do, but is not typically done in this qualitative flux analysis. Um, so that's a little more information about the labeling. And then to talk a little bit about the software and how it works, um, before the experiment is done, we actually uh, decide which metabolites we want to look for. And so this would be helped by um, taking maybe your metabolic pathways of interest, uh, uh, making a list of all of the metabolites in those pathways, um, and then knowing the retention times for your particular um, liquid chromatography method. And so we put all of those into the software, and then the software is able to find uh, the compounds for the particular masses of the compounds. We can look at the mass spectra, and then we also get a picture of our isotopologs. So in this uh, group up here, we have no label, no carbon-13 labeling in this group. Um, and down at the bottom, we see there's some uh, of this M plus zero or non-carbon-13 labeled molecule. And then on the right, we also have a fully labeled um, carbon-13 molecule. Again, this is a fumarate example. Once we have this data and we know um, how much of a compound is labeled in any given sample, we can 
lay that onto this metabolic pathway using uh, pathway mapping software. So in this case, um, we can again look at fumarate down here and look at how it's labeled across those different samples um, shown on the previous slide. Okay, so now that I've given a little bit of background on both of these technologies, I want to cover a couple different examples um, and, and actually share with you how can, what can these technologies help us understand. Um, there are a lot of different things that cells can do and they can rewire their metabolism to change their function. And this is often in response to some sort of uh, external stimuli. And when cells change their function, um, some of the functional changes that can happen include activation of cells, uh, proliferation of cells, differentiation, apoptosis, and dysfunction. Um, and so we'll go over some examples that show how cells are changing function and how we can monitor how metabolic rates are changing during this change in, in cell function. And the examples that I'll be covering in this particular talk include looking at um, the activation of macrophages, um, the cool temperature ad adaptation of adipocyte or fat cells, and then we'll also look at fuel sources uh, for cancer, cancer cells. Okay, so the first example, I'll focus on metabolism in macrophages, in particular when they're undergoing activation. And again, we're going to look at this with both cellular and molecular resolution, so both the seahorse and LCMS um, resolution. So to give you a general view of what is going on in these cells, just as a primer for this example, um, we have macrophage cells again, as I mentioned on the last slide, and we're really in this example going to focus in on glycolysis um, and the rates of, of metabolites through the glycolytic pathway. And then we'll also take a look at the TCA cycle and the rates of metabolites through the TCA cycle, which is again, correlated with the oxygen consumption of the cells. Um, and again, the glycolysis is correlated with the extracellular acidification of the cells. Uh, the data that I'll be showing for this example was provided by uh, Professor Gerald uh, Leroy Mamou from the Imperial College of London. And so we thank him for his help with that. Okay, so just to go over the design of this, of this assay, again, we're going to be looking at macrophages, um, a type of immune cell. And these, act, these macrophages are activated with a compound called lipopolysaccharides or LPS. Um, these lipopolysaccharides are produced by bacteria. And so when um, cell, immune cells see these lipopolysaccharides, they kind of say, hey, there's, um, there's a danger here. We need to activate and we need to um, produce an immune response. So in order to confirm the activation of these macrophage cells by LPS, um, you can look for uh, TNF-alpha production. And TNF-alpha is a cytokine that these macrophages um, that these macrophages produce when, when they are, uh, interact with lipopolysaccharides or when they're activated. So we can see in the LPS treated case, um, the macrophages do indeed produce more TNF alpha. And then if we do our uh, cellular resolution analysis of metabolic rates in these cells, um, again, we're, doing the, we're looking at the cell phenotype assay and we're looking at both oxygen consumption rate and extracellular acidification rate of these cells. And in, we also look at these cells under a basal condition as well as a stress condition. And what we can see is that the LPS treated cells have increased extracellular acidification or increased glycolytic rates um, under both the basal and the stress conditions. And then the uh, LPS treated cells also have less um, ability or less maximal oxygen consumption rate than the untreated cells. So once we've looked at the cellular resolution and seen the changes in glyco glycolysis um, and OCAR at a cellular uh, resolution, we can then take this down to the molecular resolution and do our LCMS uh, qualitative flux analysis. So in this particular case, again, we're focusing on glycolysis and the TCA cycle, and we can look at all of the, we can pull out all of the metabolites from both of these pathways and look for them during our LCMS analysis. In this particular analysis, um, it was 
itaconic acid was also looked at. So we'll see that. Um, so in this uh, LCMS qualitative flux analysis, uh, ubiquitously labeled carbon-13 uh, glucose was added to the cells, and it was added to both the control and LPS-activated macrophages. And this carbon-13 glucose was able to go through um, the different metabolic pathways within the cells, um, and we were able to look at the incorporation into the different metabolites. And so what we can see from our pathway map here is that for some of the key uh, glycolysis, glycolysis intermediates, we do see an increase in carbon-13 label incorporation into those metabolites. Um, so for instance, this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or also uh, looking at lactate over here. If we look at the TCA cycle, um, what we notice is that there's actually a decrease in metabolites found in the reductive branch of the TCA cycle. So there's a decrease over here, but there's an increase in carbon-13 labeling of the metabolites on the oxidative branch of the TCA cycle. And here's where itaconic acid becomes important to look at because it was found that although uh, glycolysis is increased in these cells, and that glycolysis um, can lead into the TCA cycle. What was happening in the TCA cycle is these metabolites were going through part of the cycle, but then being funneled out of it and, and into itaconic acid. Um, so this additional molecular resolution showed us exactly what was happening to those different metabolites. In the second example, I'll be covering uh, the fuel sources for primary adipocytes and what happens to metabolic rates during cool temperature adaptation of these cells. Um, so this work was uh, provided and the data was provided by Professor Orman McDougald at the University of Michigan. In this case, we have a similar view of the cell, but keep in mind, we're now looking at uh, adipocyte cells or fat cells. So we have some additional components in here. We'll look at glycolysis again, as well as the TCA cycle, but in this case, we'll also take a look at the pentose phosphate shunt, um, as well as lipolysis. Again, these are fat cells um, that can easily undergo lipolysis, as well as beta oxidation. And again, we're looking at what happens to these fat cells when they are um, sub subjected to a cool temperature over long periods of time. So in this particular analysis, there was some RNA-seq done. Um, and in the RNA-seq data, it was expected that during um, cool temperature adaptation of these cells, that oxidative phosphorylation would actually be increasing. So this is the reverse of the previous example. And it was expected that glycolysis would be decreasing in these cells. Again, a reverse of the previous example. If we take a look at the oxygen consumption rate of these cells um, and we look at the 31 degrees Celsius culture, we can see that the basal uh, background oxygen consumption rate of these cells has increased versus cells kept at 37 degrees Celsius. And then again, in this section here, we also see that there's an increased um, oxidative capacity of these cells. So their maximal oxygen consumption rate is also much higher than uh, the 37 degree C uh, cultured cells. We can also um, use the RNA-seq analysis to look more specifically at different genes. Um, and here we see that in addition to having a reduced glycolysis in these cells um, shown here, it's also expected that cool adaptation would reduce the flux through the pentose phosphate shunt, as well as uh, through amino acid biosynthesis and glutathione metabolism. So in order to monitor these other different pathways, we're now again able to do this LCMS qualitative flux analysis and actually look at um, <clears throat> how carbon-13 labels are incorporated into specific metabolites. So in this particular case, um, there were three different isotope labels that were used, um, the carbon-13 labeled glucose, carbon-13 labeled pyruvate, and carbon-13 labeled glutamine. Um, and so this is just showing the pathway again, again on the left. Um, at the top, we'll focus on the carbon-13 labeled glucose data. And what we see here is that 
we again confirm this reduced flux of glucose um, through the glycolysis pathway by looking at carbon-13 labeled glucose. We see at 37 degrees, there's quite a bit of labeling that gets incorporated, um, but at 31 degrees, this uh, labeling is much reduced. And you can see that um, not only for fructose 6-phosphate and glucose 6-phosphate, but also for some other uh, metabolites in that glycolytic pathway. If we take a look at the pentose phosphate shunt, we also see that there's a decrease in label incorporation of glucose into uh, ribulose and xylulose 5-phosphate. So again, we're seeing a reduction in the rate through, of glucose through that pathway. Um, and then if we take a look at the TCA cycle, if we look at citrate or isocitrate as well as malate, we again see this reduction in labeling uh, of the pathway when the cells are at 31 degrees Celsius. So if we take a look uh, now at pyruvate and glutamine, we find a sort of reverse picture here. And we find that at 31 degrees Celsius, the labels from pyruvate and glutamine actually are incorporated more in those cells at the cool temperatures than at the, at the higher temperature. But does this really explain all of the increase in oxygen consumption rate that we originally saw with the seahorse assay? So again, we went back, or they went back to the seahorse assay and decided to look at um, the oxygen consumption rate in more detail. And at this time, we're using uh, uh, an assay where we're able to look at the fuel sources of the oxygen consumption rate. And so in this particular case, um, OCAR experiments were completed with inhibitors of mitochondrial fatty acid uptake, as well as inhibitors of lipolysis. So when we add this inhibitor of the fatty acid uptake into the mitochondria, so we're adding etamoxer in this case, we see that this increased oxygen consumption rate at cool temperatures is actually reduced back to this sort of normal 37 degree case. Um, and then if we also use this lipolysis inhibitor, um, we again see a reduction in this increased oxygen consumption rate. And so both of these together indicate that the oxygen consumption rate increase in cool temperature adaptation is really coming, by, coming from uh, lipolysis and beta oxidation of fatty acids in the mitochondria. So in this particular story, we're seeing how transcriptomic seahorse XF and LCMS flux analysis all really combine to reveal what is happening uh, in the metabolic rates of these uh, fat cells that are uh, adapted to 31 degrees Celsius. All right, so I'll get on to my next example here. And I'm trying to see if I can get rid of this bar at the top, but it doesn't look like it's going away. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so in the third example, I'll be covering uh, some fuel sources for different cancer cells. And again, we're going to look at this at both cellular and molecular resolution. Okay, so in this particular example, we'll be looking at uh, the metabolic phenotypes of non-small cell lung cancer cells. And it is well shown in the literature that there are some um, predominant mutations that are found in some of the non-small cell lung cancer cells. In particular, there's this KRAS mutant that happens in about a quarter of these types of cancers. And then we have the EGFR mutant that happens in about 20% 20, 20 of these cells. So in the non-small cell lung cancer, um, there, there is some uh, expectation that some of these mutations will have an impact on cellular uh, metabolic phenotype. And in particular, there's some suggestion that the, some of these cells may be using lactate as a major fuel source. And so we wanted to study this a little bit uh, deeper. Um, in this particular example, again, we'll have a large focus on glycolysis in the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain, um, but we're also going to focus in on uh, lactate transport in these cells. So in, in particular, we're focusing on two different mutants, as I mentioned before. We have a PC9 uh, mutant for the EGFR mutation and an A549 mutant for the KRAS mutation. 
And these cells are going to be fueled with both glucose and lactate. And then we'll take a look at inhibition of some enzymes that are involved or thought to be involved in this lactate transport. So in particular, we'll be looking at an inhibitor for the mitochondrial pyruvate carrier. Carrier. So when lactate enters the cell, it's converted, it can be converted into pyruvate, and then that can be carried into the mitochondria to fuel the TCA cycle. Um, and we'll also look at inhibition of the monocarboxylate transporter 1, which is uh, well known in many uh, cell examples to transport lactate into and out of the cell. So in this particular analysis for the seahorse portion of the analysis, we focused on the real-time ATP rate assay. And again, this assay really tells us what component of ATP production is being used to fuel, um, uh, is being fueled by mitochondria versus being fueled by glycolysis. Um, and there was actually a study done uh, internally to Agilent where we looked at a couple of different cancer cell lines and tried to look at uh, how mitochondrial ATP production compared to glycolytic ATP, ATP production in these cells. And we found some maybe surprising results. Um, so we found that there are cancer cells that heavily fuel their ATP production by mitochondrial respiration and others that really heavily fueled their, their um, ATP production through glycolysis. But there wasn't necessarily an inverse relationship here. So there are some cells that have very little a ATP production overall. And that was interesting to see. So back to our non-small cell lung cancer example. Um, here we're showing the PC9 mutant, EGFR mutant cells on the left, and then the KRAS mutant cells on the right. And here again, we're going to be looking at cells that are fueled with both lactate and glucose. Um, and what we found from these particular studies is that the EGFR, uh, EGFR mutated cells actually use lactate to increase their mitochondrial ATP production. So they're shuttling lactate into the cell and then using that lactate as a fuel source. On the other hand, the KRAS mutant didn't seem to be using lactate in this way. So although these are both two types of non-small cell, non cell lung cancer, uh, cancers, they're actually functioning in different ways uh, metabolically. So if we take a deeper dive into uh, the PC9 cells and look at what is actually helping the cells use lactate for energy, um, we did our inhibition studies here. So we're inhibiting MCT1 in the red boxes and then inhibiting MPC in the, in the purple boxes. And what we found here is that the inhibition of MCT1 does not actually reduce the amount of mitochondrial ATP production, um, but inhibition of MPC did reduce that. Um, and so this was interesting because again, MCT1 is the known lactate transporter, but in this particular case, it doesn't seem to be uh, helping with the import of lactate into the cells um, for the fuel utilization. We also did a qualitative flux analysis to get a, a more detailed view of what was happening to specific metabolites in the TCA cycle um, and, and seeing uh, how lactate was being incorporated into these metabolites. So again, we're looking at the PC9 cells and we're looking at uh, addition of uh, carbon-13 labeled lactate to these cells. Um, so we have lactate boxed up here and then succinate boxed down here. And we've also taken the data from the previous slide and sort of rotated it so that it, it's easy to compare with this metabolic flux data. Um, but what we see here is there's actually quite good comparison between this data. So if we take these four conditions here, um, they actually map pretty well with uh, these four bars um, from the qualitative flux analysis. Um, so what we see is that in in the case of the vehicle or the MCT1 inhibition, we do see high incorporation of this labeled lactate into all of these TCA cycle intermediates. Um, but once we add that uh, MPC inhib inhibitor, inhibitor again, so the UK, in these two cases of that addition, we actually see a much lower uh, flow of lactate into these uh, TCA cycle intermediates. Okay, so the kind of conclusion from this study is that the cellular mitochondrial ATP production is really resulting from molecular uh, flux of lactate through the TCA cycle. <laughs> 
And again, we can take a deeper dive into what's happening to lactate and succinate in particular. Um, so in the lactate on the left here, um, since we're adding carbon, uh, ubiquitously labeled carbon-13 lactate, we expect a high um, amount of this M plus three labeled lactate to be present. And then for the succinate, we can take a, a view of this over here. And what we expect um, in, in our case of vehicle only is that we would see incorporation of this lactate label into succinate. In particular, there's a slightly higher amount of this M plus two succinate. Um, this makes a lot of sense from a TCA cycle standpoint because in that first turn of the TCA cycle, we're going to incorpor incorporate two carbons from lactate into succinate. Um, and so this is the highest peak. And then on subsequent turns of the TCA cycle, we'll actually incorporate uh, more carbon-13 labeling. All right, so yeah, I'm speeding through these examples, but I did wanna get to this last example of inhibiting fuel usage by cancer cells um, and looking at this again with the cellular and molecular resolution. So in this particular example, we're going to again be taking a look at cancer cells. And in this case, we'll be looking at the inhibition of oxidative phosphorylation and what this does to um, all sorts of metabolic pathways within the cells and the rates of metabolism through them. So this data comes from uh, Pietro Morlocchi and Jennifer Molina, who completed the studies at the MD, Can MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, in this particular case, we'll again focus somewhat on glycolysis and the TCA cycle, but we will also take a look at, again, the pentose phosphate shunt and the production of nucleotides, as well as taking a, a look at aspartate and the production of pyrimidines from aspartate. Um, so these are just a, a couple of the reasons why inhibition of oxidative phosphorylation is of interest for cancer. Um, there are some cancer cells that are heavily dependent on oxidative phosphorylation for production of their energy. And uh, one of these cancer types is acute myeloid leukemia. There's also some data in the literature suggesting that tumors can become more sensitive to inhibition of oxidative phosphorylation after the standard of care treatment. Um, so there might be some room for having combination therapeutics with an oxidative phosphorylation inhibitor. So uh, the MD Anderson Cancer Center, Cancer Center went through uh, MedChem screening uh, to look for these OxFos inhibitors. And they were able to find this compound IACS-10759 uh, that actually inhibits complex one of the electron transport chain. And this particular compound had a lot of favorable uh, qualities, like it had a low nanomolar activity in vitro. Um, it was also low in, in toxicity and had a good pharmacokinetic profile. Um, so all of these combined uh, to make them choose and study this compound in a little more detail. So in this particular case, as expected, when uh, acute myeloid leukemia cells are incubated with this IACS inhibitor, we actually find that there's a decrease in baseline oxygen consumption rates. This is completely expected. We're inhibiting one of the enzymes of the electron transport chain. So definitely our consumption of oxygen is going to go down in these cells, and it does so in a dose-dependent manner. What we see um, ha that happens or is the result of this is that there's an increase in cell death as well as reduced viability and reduced cell proliferation after in uh, inhibition of this complex one of the electron transport chain. Picture cellular resolution view of what's going on. The real question was what is actually happening in these cells and which metabolites are impacted the most? Um, and so in this particular example, there was a targeted meto metabolomics analysis of 80 different metabolites. And this was just a, a more steady state analysis of looking at after we treat the cells with this IACS inhibitor, what are the levels of these 80 different metabolites? And from here, we could see that there was uh, an accumulation of reducing equivalents in NADH. There was a reduction in these nucleotide triphosphates and an increase in the nucleotide uh, monophosphates. And then there was also this peculiar um, decrease in aspartate that was uh, pretty interesting and that um, they wanted to follow up on. So in this particular study, uh, the focus was on three different isotopically labeled tracers, uh, glucose, glutamine, and aspartate. 
So for the glucose analysis, um, what we can see here is that after uh, in cells that are in the presence of IACS, um, the labeled glucose is heavily funneled into lactate and alanine. So there's a, a huge uh, flow, increased flow of glucose through the glycolysis pathway, um, but also a reduction of the flow of glucose through the TCA cycle um, and all these TCA cycle intermediates. If we take a look at the glutamine labeled uh, case, what we see here is that <clears throat> There's actually, um, while glucose isn't really flowing through the TCA cycle, glutamine is able to actually continue to flow through the TCA cycle when uh, the cells are treated with this IACS compound. And then to get to the really interesting bit, um, back to this decrease in aspartate after uh, treatment with IACS, what we find um, is that aspartate can be used uh, to make some pyrimidines, as I mentioned um, at, on an earlier slide. And what we see here is that when we add aspartate to the cells, um, there's actually an increase in labeling um, under the condition of IACS of ATP. Sorry, I know it's hard to see down here. And then that increased labeling is also found in uh, cytidine triphosphate as well. And in an aspartate rescue experiment, the researchers were able to see that um, IACS usually reduces cell number, um, again, by causing cell death and reducing cell prol proliferation. But if we add aspartate to those cells, there's actually um, a huge regain in the cell number. So the aspartate is rescuing those cells. And this study can also be done in an in vivo case. So in particular, uh, this uh, some acute myeloid leukemia cells were injected into mice. Um, and then the mice were treated with vehicle or different levels of the IACS compound. And cells could be taken back out of these mice and analyzed. And cells analyzed um, from these mice that had the IACS treatment, again, had this lower oxygen consumption rate from the IAC IACS treatment. Um, so this was really cool to see in vivo. Um, that this would also happen. And then again, with the IACS treatment, we could look at the aspartate levels, um, again, from samples collected from these animals. And in the animals treated with higher doses of IACS, there was a reduction in the levels of aspartate in the whole animal. So this is really having an impact on the whole organism now. And then again, with uh, looking at survival time in these animals, we've they the researchers found that the IACS treatment uh, does increase survival time, the highest doses about uh, doubling survival time. Um, so that was exciting for them to see. So again, the seahorse measurements and LCMS qualitative flux analysis was able to really zero in on the mechanism of action of this IACS. CS compound. And uh, again, uh, glycolysis was um, really funneled into lactate and alanine in, in these cells, and glutamine was used to fuel the TCA cycle. Um, we were, there was also this reduction in aspartate and nucleotides. So essentially, the IACS compound is leading to this depletion of nucleotides, which um, as cells in, encounter DNA damage, there's um, a less ability to recover from this damage and less DNA biosynthesis. Um, and this causes the reduced proliferation and cell death. So with that, um, I'll summarize uh, the, you know, the examples that I've gone over in this talk, um, and especially want to highlight the fact that these metabolic flux measurements um, really provide insights into the metabolic shifts across different cell states. Um, and I showed a bunch of different research applications in this talk, but there are also a lot of other research applications that can be used for these technologies. Um, so we can monitor T cell activation, um, particularly in, if, in infectious disease and cancer immunotherapy. Um, we could also monitor stem cell differentiation. Um, there's uh, a huge promise for using these techniques to look at functional uh, genomic screens of different CRISPR libraries. Um, so there are a lot of different applications that this could be useful for. And so with that, um, I guess I, I really want to reiterate this point that um, doing this type of flux analysis and really getting at the metabolic rates going on inside these cells helps us reveal what cells are doing. We're not just looking at what they are, but what they are actually doing. And I'll leave with this last message that metabolic shifts in any living system are really causally linked 
to alterations in the flux through one or more different metabolic pathways. So with that, I'm, I'm happy that you joined the seminar and I'm excited to take your questions. Thank you, Genevieve, for a wonderful talk. Um, we have uh, a couple of questions. The very uh, first is uh, asking about uh, the sample preparation, I believe. So the specific question is asking, uh, are, um, are the analysis and measurements made using samples of blood, samples from air, or in water? Great. Yeah, no, I, I guess I, I'm sorry I didn't clarify this earlier. That's a really good question. So in all of the examples I show, what we're doing um, in the seahorse analysis is you're monitoring live cells that have been plated in, uh, for instance, a 96 well plate. Um, and so those are live cells sitting in culture media and you're monitoring um, the glycolysis and respiration from those cells. And then in the LCMS uh, quality, data flux analysis, um, there are a lot of uh, versions of how you can do this, um, but the, the examples I gave in this talk were for cell, cell culture. So you're adding that isotopically labeled compound to cells in culture, um, and then you, you remove the media after some period of time from those cells, and you go through a typical LCMS uh, cellular sample prep. Um, typically, this is addition of, a, of an organic solvent, um, often done at, at cold temperatures uh, to really quench metabolism quickly. Um, and then you can extract the metabolites from those cells and run those on the LCMS. Um, and then in the, there was that one example of the animal studies. You can do these types of studies in animals as well, both um, taking cells from those animals to put them in the seahorse, or you can um, actually add isotopically labeled compounds to the animals, you know, give them an injection, for instance, and then uh, take cells or samples from those animals and see what happened to those isotopically labeled compounds over time. Wonderful. The next question is asking, regarding the assays that test the metabolism of cancer cells, assuming one can inhibit the pathways that fuel the oncogenes, one can possibly trigger apoptosis of uh, apoptosis cell death. Are you looking along those lines? Um, yeah, I think that's something of that's a, of a lot of interest in the field. Um, I think I can't say that we're specifically looking at that um, in our internal research programs, but I think that um, the technologies that I shared with you today, researchers could use to understand that topic better. Great. Uh, the next question is asking, how few cells can be used for each of these analyses, seahorse and stable label isotope tracing? Great question. Um, so for the seahorse analysis, typically it varies uh, depending on the cell type you're using and how metabolically active it is. So the more active it, it is, um, the easier it is to get a signal from it. Um, typically what we're using in those seahorse assays is the number of cells that would roughly give a monolayer on a 96 well plate. Um, our seahorse plates actually have a different geometry from normal 96 well plates. So they're a little bit, um, they have a smaller, the wells have a smaller diameter than typical plates, um, not by too much, by a little bit. Um, but however many cells that would normally fit in a monolayer is, is the number of cells we use for those assays. Um, and then for the LCMS analysis, a common number of cells that would be used is something like a million cells per sample. Although I, I would say you could probably go down a little bit for these particular analyses um, to maybe the low hundreds of thousands of cells, but somewhere around there is the limit. Great. And do you wash cells by warm PBS or cold? Ah, okay, so we have some metabolomic sample prep people in, in the audience. Um, so that's a, it's another really good question. Um, there is a lot of debate in the field, even of whether you should do washing at all. Um, and so I, I think that that has to be a lab specific uh, determination of what they like best. But yeah, you could either choose not to wash the cells at all. In that case, you can have some leftover um, left behind. So it might not be best in the isotopically labeled uh, cell case. 
Um, and then yes, you could you could wash the cells with uh, warm or cool PBS. Um, and I, I there's really a, a lot of literature on both of those options. Um, so I would maybe internally test both of them and see if there's a major difference in your particular samples and then decide how to move forward. Wonderful. In the study where cells were cultured at 31 degrees, uh, was the seahorse still operated at 37? Oh yeah, that was a great question. So I had to gloss over that a little bit. In that particular study, it was done both ways. Um, so the cells were cultured at 37 and 31, and then the seahorse assays were read at both 31 and 37. Um, it does take a while for the seahorse to equilibrate to that temperature. So they had to be done on, on different cells. Um, but the example that I kind of hovered over with my mouse, that was an example where the seahorse was run at 31. Uh, and can you also perform cell culture headspace analysis to measure gas phase met uh, metabolites? Yeah, I'm, I'm not as familiar with that, um, but it should be doable um, with GCMS technologies. You should be able to do that sort of analysis. I'm not sure exactly how sensitive it is or how many uh, cells are needed for that type of analysis. I'm just not as familiar with it. Um, one more question. How do you normalize okay. your data for LCMS analysis? by protein concentration, cell number, or DNA? Uh, that's, that's uh, sorry, so you said protein, what was, oh, cell number was the second one. Uh, yeah. Okay, so definitely all our options, and I think it's, it most likely will come down to your specific example. Um, so a lot of people are, I think, are fans of the DNA normalization. Um, on the other hand, when it comes to cancer models and things like that, um, that might be a case where your different samples are going to vary in the amount of DNA the cells have. Um, and so in that case, you might want to try a, a protein concentration um, or cell number. I think in, in a lot of the studies I've done, I've you know, relied heavily on, on cell number analysis or knowing how many cells go into my assays. Um, and I get pretty tight error bars on those, um, but I think it's gonna come down to the specific case um, and, and what makes most sense. Um, there are obviously cases where your treatment of the cells might alter the proteins that are being made in those cells. And so that could, that could again, alter your protein content. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's going to come down to the specific example. Wonderful. We're running out of time. There's a comment that we will forward to uh, Genevieve on behalf of Carolina Levi, I believe. And uh, with that, thank you all for uh, being here for the seminar. Genevieve, thank you very much for your time, uh, for the great talk. We really enjoyed it a lot and we learned a lot. Uh, thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Great. Thank you. And thanks for having me. Thank you.